Hi everyone. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. I wanted to thank everybody for coming out today. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. I'm uh, Jenny Mandeville and I work for Vanderbilt Web Communications and we've been uh, working on relaunching the Digital VU Speaker Series, which is what this is a part of. Uh, and we've been, uh, it's been myself and my colleague Anna Winery. And so we just have a couple of things before we bring Daniel up to talk. Um, you don't need to worry about taking notes or anything like that during today's session. We're going to have everything available online that we're going to email out to you guys who have RSVP'd after the fact. Um, just fair warning, everyone who's doing this today has an iPhone, so if you have an Android, Android phone or a Windows phone, the app roundup that we have after the fact will include apps for those other platforms, but unfortunately the three of us are all Apple aficionados. So. Um, and if you're here and you didn't RSVP, that's fine. Um, but if you'd like to sign up for uh, future emails, uh, there's a sign-up sheet right over there by the door and just write your name and email address and we'll add you to the list so you can hear about all of the fabulous things that are going to gonna be going on in the next year or so. Yep. And uh, so now we're going to bring up our speaker. Uh, Daniel Dubois is the director of the University Photography Department, Photography Department here at Vanderbilt which is within Creative Services and falls under the larger public affairs umbrella here at Vanderbilt. And um, we appreciate him coming out, so we'll let him take it away with his brand new iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, for like one week every two years, I get to be uh, relatively cutting edge. So this is my week. This is it. Uh, I, I did. Uh, no, 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 not, not the plus. Not the plus. Yes, yes, I, I can actually hold it in my hand. Well, you know, yeah, we have a new device, so that makes today particularly exciting. Uh, but I love teaching this class, so thanks for being here. Um, you know, this new device, it's fun, it's fresh, but um, more than that, I think what makes today particularly exciting for me is we've sort of reached a point where all these incremental changes, all these incremental improvements over the years have really added up to create this device that is more creative, more collaborative than anything we've ever had before. Um, and as a, as a creative person, as a visual person, that's enormously exciting. And it's those incremental changes that have led me to some very recent and kind of shocking conclusions for me as a photographer. So I'll share those with you at the end. But, you know, when you think about it, like we were over here, you know, eight, ten years ago, we didn't even have phones and cameras combined. Now we go over here eight, ten years later, and it's just amazing what we've got. And, and you just, you, it's just, it's, it's so exciting to see what you can do now, what, what you can carry around ounce for ounce, dollar for dollar. There's nothing that's more uh, collaborative or creative in the world today. And it's truly exciting to be able to talk about that today. Um, so a couple ground rules before we get started. Um, we are going to be moving really, really quick through some of this stuff, okay? So this is not meant to be a comprehensive tutorial on this stuff. Um, it's meant to get your feet wet, to, make, to build some confidence, to where then you're gonna wanna go out after we're done here today, download some of these apps and continue to play with them. But if we get going kind of fast and you think, oh wait, wait, what's going on? Um, just just kind of ride with it and go with it, particularly when we get into talking about the editing apps, uh, we'll, we'll kind of pick up our speed. Um, this is the only meeting where it is okay for you to be playing on your phones. Yay, I encourage it. So please feel free to um, play along with us as, as we're uh, talking. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end, as Jenny mentioned. So if you've got like a really lengthy question or something that's going to require a lengthy answer, just hold on to that. If you've got something, if you just want to see, see me do something again or you've got a one-word answer sort of question, just yell it out. Okay, just say, hey, do that again. You know, or, or what was that? Um, but if you've got a lengthy kind of philosophy sort of question, just hold that until, until the end. All right. Um, well, we're going to be breaking this down today into three categories. Uh, we're going to talk first about the taking of the photos. Second is the editing of the photos. And then third, Jenny and Anna are going to come back up and talk about the sharing of the photos. So uh, let's uh, jump in. Uh, first thing we're going to do is talk just a little bit about hardware. Yes, the new camera is a little, is a little bit better. Uh, it, in some ways it's a little bit, in some ways it's a lot better. Uh, it's 8 megapixels versus 6. Uh, the low light capabilities are really good on it, but um, 
it won't present, prevent you from taking bad photos, okay? So you still have to think a little bit. And my one word of admonition kind of starting off is the iPhone is inherently very portable, very instantaneous, very of the moment, and that's great. Slow down just a little bit. Take a breath. Um, think about what you're doing. Think about light, okay? Um, and, and how you position your subject. So there's my one photographer uh, 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 word, of, word of advice. Um, let's talk just real briefly again about hardware. Uh, if you're going to be using your phone, uh, it means you're going to have it out. So unless you like plan on locking it away somewhere, um, buy a case, okay? Um, they're cheap. I know they, they sort of make the phone ugly, but, but really it's better than paying $700 for a brand new phone. Uh, Otter boxes are, are a favorite of our office because we're pretty tough on things, uh, although almost any case will do a, a good job. Uh, I've got a couple from Spigen. Uh, that are, are doing quite nicely. We have three children, three small children at home that all play with the phone, and so for my wife, I buy the OtterBox Defender, which you sort of have to take out, you have to sort of take out a HELOC loan to be able to pay for the case, but it, it's well worth it. Get a case. Uh, second thing you might want to pick up is, uh, this is a little tripod from Joby. It's about a foot tall. Uh, this is called the Gorilla Pod. What makes this neat is you can then take those arms and twist them around things so it'll fit it allow you to put your camera on uneven objects. Uh, and they're relatively cheap and small, and you can travel with them. Okay? Joby, J-O-B-I. By the way, um, Photo Jojo is kind of a fun site where you can pick up a lot of stuff, a lot of just accessories. P-H-O-T-O, J-O-J-O dot com. A lot of neat little gifts and things like that. So if you've got a shutter bug in the family, it's fantastic for Christmas gifts there. You almost can't go wrong, unless, of course, you're purchasing one of these. Okay, don't be this person, right? I mean, it just sort of goes against the grain of the iPhone, which is portable, right? right? We were talking about that, just very instantaneous and very of the moment. If you're going to do this, just jeepers, bring out the DSLR. You know, I don't, I don't get it, but hey, um, to each their own. Um, this is a little more acceptable, but still, like, you're going to get some eye rolls um, uh, with, with these. These are accessory lenses where you can kind of change the optics of the, of the thing. Okay, again, I'm talking about um, bad pictures. This is a really bad picture. This is my son. We were just, I said, hey, I need to take a really bad picture. So totally, totally backlit. Um, I've turned him just a little bit. Okay, a little bit better. But then, there, that's, that's a lot better lighting. Now, let's say nothing of the, kind of the distracting background. But you can just see just with a little bit of thought, um, you, can, you can make things be okay. Um, we're going to jump now into uh, the camera app, but first let's hit our settings. We're going to turn on the photo grid. Okay, so under settings, uh, that's under uh, photos and camera. And if you scroll down there, see that little slider, grid? Okay, let's turn it on, and I'm going to show you what that's going to bring up. Now we're going to go into our stock camera app. They have done a fantastic job with this app. They've added some features that you previously needed to go out and buy a third-party app to get. They've taken those and incorporated them and basically kind of made those other apps sort of irrelevant. We're going to touch on a couple of them. But um, what you're going to see now, see those, see those uh, three lines, two horizontal, two, four lines, two horizontal, two vertical? Okay, this is reinforcing the rule of thirds. It's a common photography principle. So what you want to do is put your subject of interest on the intersection of one of those, see the, where those intersect, those four points? If you put your subject on there, your subject of interest is going to add, it's going to increase your um, uh, just kind of compositional interest. Helps you also to keep like your horizon line when you're shooting those sunsets uh, level. You, put your, you can put your horizon line kind of on that lower third. Okay? Just some basic rules of photography that those lines will help you to reinforce. Okay? Let's jump into uh, talking just some about um, the other, uh, the, the basic uh, functionality of the camera. By default, it's going to autofocus, uh, but if you tap anywhere, it's going to focus on that point. So sometimes it's going to guess wrong. You know, like let's say I want to focus on that flag back there, tap on that. But now the medallion's out of focus, so I'm going to tap on that. Okay. Interestingly. And for the first time ever, this seems simple, but you've never been able to do this before. Um, the, it brings up this little sunshine. It's really hard to see, but do you guys see that down there? Okay. I can swipe down, and it gets darker. Swipe up, and it gets lighter. 
seems simple, but you've never been able to do that before, and it's huge. That's iOS 8. So it's not just exclusive to the 6. If you have an iPhone 5, iPhone 5S, or iPhone 6, you can install iOS 8. If you have an iPhone 4S, you technically can install iOS 8. I would not recommend it. Okay? It's just a little bit too much software. But that is available to anybody for free that has a 5, 5S, or a 6. Okay? Very cool. You, of course, still have your pinch and zoom, or uh, you know, pinch to zoom. Um, I, I rarely use this. Here's why. Because you're not optically zooming. There's a difference between optical zoom and digital zoom. All you're doing there is digitally zooming in, which is the exact same thing as taking a picture, not zooming in, and then cropping it after the fact. There's no more information when you zoom in. Okay, so only if you just really want to. Concerts, things like that, it just saves you a step in the process, but you're not actually gaining anything out of that. Okay? Um, another really cool thing that they've added is this self-timer. Believe it or not, you had to have a, an app to do this. But you can see the off 3 seconds, 10 seconds, um, and, and then it'll allow you to do a self-timer with that. So great, great ad there. HDR stands for High Dynamic Range. That's where if you've got, like, let's say, a really pretty um, landscape photo, you've got a lot of really bright brights in the clouds, and you've got a, real, a lot of really shadows, it will attempt to kind of compress those and make it more like what you see. Here's the thing. In this, in the stock app, I never use that. I've taken photos with it, and it doesn't, I can't see a difference. I mean, it's like 2% difference. So I always leave that off. I find it kind of useless. There are third-party apps that do, that, purport to be HDR apps, but they're not really, they're not doing true HDR, and so it sort of is just pointless. Speaking of pointless, the flash, okay? Um, you can go down here uh, to the little flash, you see that in the bottom right-hand corner, and auto, on, off. It is off 100% of the time for me, unless like our baby's doing something funny as she's sleeping, you know, whatever, then we go in, we, you know, the flash there is great. But they've improved it a lot, but it's still relatively useless, so um, just leave it off. Um, now, uh, live filters, this is these little circles uh, up there. You can access those. You see that top right-hand corner? Um, it's just live filters. It's kind of giving you a preview if you select. Um, I, my wife asked me the other day, like, well, why would I want to do that on the front end? Can I do that on the back end? The answer is yes. So I find these to be kind of more gimmick than anything, although they are nice when you're shooting video because uh, I, I think it's a little harder to add filters after the fact with video. Um, but there it is. I usually leave it off. You can just click in the center to clear that out. Uh, the little scroll thing down there, kind of in the middle, um, you can see square um, is for shooting Instagram, although I just crop it afterwards. Don't use that. Um, and then panoramic, right? Do you guys know this? So you It'll kind of instruct you, you keep it moving. And then when you're done, you don't have to go through the whole thing. You can just hit stop, and it's done. Okay? It'll give you a full 180 degrees if you want it, but then you can just hit stop. There's the group, right? Okay. Back into this. Uh, let's talk about video real quick. Slow-mo mode is new and unique to the iOS 6. It records at 240 frames a second. So every second you're taking 240 pictures, more or less is what that's saying. Normally, it's 30. So you see you're capturing eight times the amount of information. What that gives you is this. You can move where it goes slow and where it goes fast. The complexity of what is going on here is mind-blowing. If you know anything about video, you know that this is incredibly hard to do. It records it at 720, uh, which is very high res. Um, and <laughs> no. I mean, it's, you could just 
have all kinds of fun with that. Okay, these are just simple examples, but this is, this is why I get excited. I mean, this is a neat creative tool that's never before been available in such a user-friendly, easy-to-use package, and that is, that's tremendously exciting. Um, the other thing that is uh, useful here on the camera app is the time lapse. Okay. Um, Okay, that's where it's going to take a long amount of video and compress it down. The built-in app does okay, but I would recommend Instagram's Hyperlapse. That's the, that's the name of the app. Uh, it does, uh, provides a little more information. It also allows you to control the speed with which you do uh, your, uh, the Hyperlapses. Um, word, fair, fair warning here, this one is pretty, this example is um, kind of nauseating but I just did this walking over here. So this is what it does. It automatically smooths out. I mean, if you were to see me actually shooting this, it's incredibly bouncy. So it's got algorithms that go in there and help smooth things out, okay? Hyperlapse. So there's Instagram. Now they've come out with a, a version called, uh, an app called Hyperlapse, okay? And it's quite good and easy to use. Great, that's the stock camera app. Very useful. Let me just touch on Camera Plus, which is, uh, used to be kind of the go-to app for people wanting to uh, do uh, more with the taking end of things. But again, some of the key features that made this uh, interesting, they've incorporated into the stock app. So I personally can't find a reason why you would want to use this. But one of the things that they did that was neat was to separate, again, click to uh, bring up your focus point. Then you see that little plus symbol. If you click that, it's going to bring up now the exposure. So that what you could do is separate your exposure and your focus. So that if I wanted to focus on the desk, and then, but my exposure is pegged to the windows out there, it's going to pick that up and I can move that around. But that takes a long time to do, right? And jeepers, if you're shooting kids like I am a lot, forget it. I don't ever use that. But it's there. Now you know you've heard of Cam Plus, Camera Plus. Uh, it's, I think, $1.99 uh, or something like that. Okay? So that's the capture of the image. Now let's move into editing the pictures, right? Because that's really where the magic happens. Okay? The, the cameras, again, it's good. If you've done all your homework, you know, done taking your time, taking a really nice photo. But now you want to add that extra level of polish that's really going to set it apart. That's what these editing apps do. Fair warning again here, um, we're going to move fast, so this is just meant to introduce you to it, to inspire you, and, and hopefully motivate you to go out and try this on your own. We're going to be working with Snapseed today. Um, there are a blue million apps that do editing. They all do editing. Everything does editing now. Everything does taking, everything does editing, everything does sharing. The trick is to find what you like, what works for you, uh, and what adds the most functionality for you. So. First thing we're going to do is it's going to say, okay, do you want to load a uh, photo? Yes. Let's load this one. Okay, over at 100 Oaks the other day. Decent photo, beautiful sky, decent photo. But how do we really make it sing? Well, I mentioned um, the other day, I mentioned... Um, iOS is not fully there yet. It's got some bugs. There we go. I mentioned earlier HDR. So this is an HDR filter within Snapseed. Okay? And Snapseed allows an unbelievable amount of control. So I can control how much of that effect I want there to be. And see it's compressing those tones, just making things a little more vibrant. And you can see already just with that one thing, there's where we were, there's where we are now. Okay? So I'm going to accept that change. Let's work on it just a little bit more. Let's do some kind of global stuff to it. Um, let's tune the image. Uh, the brightness, I'm going to bring that up just a little bit because it looks a little dark to me. Uh, the warmth, I'm going to warm it up. That building looks a little cool to me. Okay, you can see where we were, where we are now. Okay, we're just layering this up, making it a little bit better. We're going to accept that change. Uh, the other cool thing that Snapseed does is you can target certain areas. 
So what I've gone into now is uh, called selective adjust. I'm going to tap where I want that. And now you see that circle that comes up? Now any adjustment that I'm getting ready to make will be confined to just within that circle. So brightness, I want to pop that logo just a little bit. It's kind of dying for me. Okay, adjust that down. And now I'm going to bring up contrast, add a little bit there. Okay, saturation, let's really punch that yellow. Okay, and now there's where we were, there's where we are now. Now, I believe it's uh, 99 cents or $1.99. Most of these, most all of these are, yeah, relatively cheap. No kidding, really? Well, it's free to the participants of this program. <laughs> all right, last thing, last thing I'm going to do, one of the last things is, let's just add um, tilt shift. So this is just where we're going to selectively kind of focus an area. Okay, right, just to bring your, bring your focus right to that V. See how we're blurring that out? Okay, again, just to add a little bit of drama to the picture. And then lastly, let's sharpen it because I find most all the photos that come from straight off the camera are just a little bit soft. So if you just sharpen them just a little bit, punch it up some, it's going to look a little more interesting, a little more artsy. So I'm pretty happy with this. Um, you can just by touching it, you can see that's where we were, which wasn't awful. And that's where we are now. Big, 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 big difference okay, in what it looks like. Now, I mean, you could argue, well, I don't really like the way that looks. Okay, but the point is, I mean, there's, there's a lot you can do uh, with that. Okay, um, I think, let's see. What we'll also do then is just push it out, save to photo library, and now it's in your camera roll. Now you can go on, you can, do, you can edit another photo. Okay. Um, you can do a. You don't have to name it. Right, there are no names. Yeah, so um, Apple doesn't allow for that. I, I would guess in Android or some of the other more open systems you can. Uh, but it's just saved in your camera roll by last created. Okay? You do the same thing with portraits. Um, I do that a lot where you're, you're using that selective adjustment, just bringing the brightness out a little bit in the face, and then fading the background, darkening the background a little bit, just kind of bringing in a vignette. Okay, to just punch, punch the photos a little bit, raise that uh, contrast, raise the saturation just a little bit. Yeah. Oh, great question. So the, so the answer is, uh, once I save it, is that it? And the, <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, they, they are non-destructive. In other words, it saves your original, and then it saves the new version as well. So you don't have to worry about that. Great question. Okay. Um, you have adding vignettes, uh, that center focus, and then adding filters, which is, I mean, everything does filters now, right? Um, let me show you uh, another app that I really like. It's called Facetune. Uh, this is equal parts cool and scary. So I feel so sorry for this girl. She has been worked on probably so much, but this is just a demo image that comes with the app, but this is a face uh, manipulation, skin manipulation app. So I'm going to select that. Okay, let's zoom in. And then you've got a full assortment of tools here. Let's uh, start to work kind of on the face over here. I'm going to go down to my patch tool. I'm going to click, and it's going to bring up a circle, and it's going to say, okay, essentially, where do you want me to do the skin graft from? <laughs> right? Okay, I'm going to accept that change, just knock those out, and just keep going, you know. Listen, you guys, the power here is, um, is immense. <laughs> exactly. And less permanent. Okay? So you could just keep going on this all day long, right? Let's do this. Uh, oh, teeth whitening, right? Well, looky there. There's our whitening brush. So I'm going to click on that and then just start wiping away. Okay? Before and after. She used to dip, now she doesn't. <laughs> All right. Uh, accept those changes. Now let's, let's go into the really scary. Um, let's get rid of some of this shine. Let's see. We can, I've got a smoothing tool. You can see I'm just touching the screen and just kind of smoothing those things out. Okay. 
Move around. Exactly. That's the message. Okay. Take care of all that. And again, you can see there's where we are now. There's where we were. Okay. And we can even reshape her face because why not, right? <laughs> so I'm going to go in, just kind of manipulate the nose. Yeah. Soften out that chin just a little bit. And who wouldn't want a thinner neck, right? Because I don't know why, but we all want to look like giraffes. <laughs> So, right, get rid of one of your chins, and who wouldn't want bigger eyeballs? So, there you go. Weird, weird is exactly right. It's exactly right. So, look, at you. no, but I can make them smaller. All right. So, there's, there's skin tones, there's some other things in here, but okay, there's where we were, there's where we are now. Again, you can save that out, push it out to social media. I told you it was equal parts cool and terrifying. All right, let me just touch real briefly, because my time's just about over, on a couple of other apps that I think are neat, and I just want to kind of name drop them so that you'll have some familiarity with them. Visco Cam, okay, that's this one right here. It's actually VSCO. That stands for Visual Supply Company. Now you can break that out whenever you're going to East Nashville, and you can be hip, just like all those other hipsters who are using Visco Cam, right? It's Visco. Um, but it's a really popular one for adding filters onto images. Do you guys know what I mean when I say filters, right? It's those vintage filters that 20 years ago people called mistakes, right? You can add those onto your, onto your photos now and add a degree of, of artsiness to them. Um, the other thing that it does that I think is really neat is they have this uh, social media, that's not social media, but it's a, it's a networking platform called Grid. It's Visco Grid. You can Google it. You can get it on your computer. You don't have to be tied to your uh, device. But it's a curated repository of some really fantastic images. Whereas things like Facebook and Instagram aren't curated, this is. Uh, and I really like it for inspiration. So that's Visco Cam. Again, all these do a, kind of a lot of the same things. Uh, the other one is Waterlog, and what it does is it takes images. There's that same image that we were working with earlier and turns it into a watercolor. Now, ordinarily, I, I'm, I'm not a gimmicky sort of person, right? Photoshop has a lot of these filters where it makes it look like, oh, look, it's an oil painting. Now you're an artist. You did oil painting. They're really quite awful, um, but this one is it's actually pretty good. I mean, if you zoom in, let me get it turned. If you zoom in and look at it, the detail on that is pretty convincing. I like it. I think it's neat. And particularly if you're doing blogs or whatnot, and you just need just something offbeat, right, uh, to put with your blog post. Um, it's kind of cool. It does a really good job of portraits, uh, too. Uh, let me just load one of those real quick, because it is kind of fun to see it paint. Um, sorry you're having to endure a lot of family photos, but... So this is our youngest. Isn't that cool? And then there's a lot of uh, fine detail that you can do. You can change how detailed it is, uh, the brightness. There's an infinite number. I mean, you can just see all the different types of renderings that you can do with it. So it's very adjustable, too. Very neat. Uh, last thing that I want to point out is pick frame. Are you guys going to do gritty stuff? OK. Pick frame is free. It's really easy to use. You're, this is how you do what's called diptychs. That's another one you can throw out when you're in East Nashville. Is, oh, yeah, yeah, I did a, put together a couple diptychs today. Plus, it's just fun to say. I like the way that kind of comes off. Um, you, you can select a template here, and then you can add, add your photos in here. Okay? So it's really easy just to do that. It's going to auto-load them. And then there's... Um, ton of ways that you can adjust these borders, you can adjust the colors, you can even layer in text. Save that out to your camera roll again. Now you can push it uh, to any one of your social media 
uh, things that you want to. Or you can just save it and, and enjoy it, print it out. Okay, uh, let me make sure that I got everything. Hipstamatic, yes, I have to give a shout out to Hipstamatic. That was the original kind of vintage filtery app. It's incredibly quirky, really hard to use, no control, but I love it, I love it. Maybe that's just me because I, I, I do photography all the time, so I really like totally unplugging and not thinking about it. This app will not let you think about it. It's just got this yellow button and you push it and the viewfinder is really small and I'm making it sound terrific, I know, but, um, but I love it. So it's fun, but I, I, honestly, I don't use it a whole lot. If you do a lot of transfer from your phone to your computer, get Photo Transfer App. It's a wireless uh, transfer app that is terrific. You get the app on your phone, you install a free app on your computer, and then you're able to wirelessly connect to your camera roll and transfer things back and forth. It has made life so much better. It also allows Photo Transfer App is the name of it. It's, I think it's like $1.99. It is worth every penny, particularly if you do a lot with your DSLR, right, with an actual camera. You can kind of cheat and make yourself look a lot better of an iPhone photographer than what you actually are because you're taking it with, you know, really high-end camera, you're uploading it to your phone, then pushing that out to Instagram. People are like, oh, my goodness, you're a genius with your iPhone. You're like, yes, I am. But really, <laughs> you've, you've taken it with some legit gear and then just pushed it out through uh, the iPhone. So taking the image and then just transferring it via the photo transfer app. Of course, I mean, you can always just email the photo to yourself and then save it to your camera roll. That's another way to do that, okay? Okay. I am, I'm out of time, but I did want to share uh, the, the one kind of shocking thing uh, that, that I thought I'd never say to a group of people, and that is, you know, we get asked a lot, you know, oh, well, I want to buy a point-and-shoot camera. Let me be clear. It's, I'm talking about compact point-and-shoot, not, not DSLRs, not the big, big cameras. I have stopped recommending people buy point-and-shoot cameras. These little guys... <laughs> that we all seem to have are, in fact, uh, they meet the old saying of the best camera is the one you have with you. It's always with you. And in 90 to 95% of the situations that you're in, it's going to perform as well or better than your point and shoot. And quite probably most important, you're more likely to share them the images that you create, the moments that you're capturing with other people when you take them with your phone. We've got a point and shoot. I bought my wife a you know, pretty decent point and shoot. I have to. I'm a photographer, right? She can't show up with you know, something that looks like it came out of a cereal box. And, and I just, I, for fun, last night I was just testing it. And the iPhone, this new iPhone, outperforms it in terms of quality. But more importantly, she's got pictures on that camera from last year that nobody has ever seen. And I think that's a shame. So if you're going to be a creative person, Share it with the world. I highly recommend this, the, the iPhone, even over a dedicated point-and-shoot camera. Jenny's now going to talk, and Anna are going to share a little bit about how to share sort of that third category of what to do with your photos. Okay, good, that's working. Okay, so as there are many apps, there are also lots of different networks for you to share the photos that you create on those apps. Um, the big ones are kind of um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, to a lesser extent, kind of um, Tumblr and Pinterest. And um, I'm gonna let Anna kind of talk about the ways that you're sharing on those networks. Yeah. Um, so Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and Pinterest are the main networks that people share photos, photos <laughs> within. Um, there's uh, many different ways that you can increase the shareability and visibility of your photos. Um, and one of those ways is to, when sharing on Instagram and Twitter specifically, um, use a hashtag. Um, does everybody know what a hashtag is and is everyone familiar with that? I'll just briefly go over it. Um, 
a hashtag um, is just the pound sign that turns a letter or a group of letters or word um, that directly follow it into a searchable link. So that will increase searchability and visibility because other people who are using the same hashtag um, will be able to see your pictures um, if you have your account set to be public. Um, that's lesser, lesser of a factor in um, Facebook just because most people have private Facebook accounts. So, and plus they just started using the hashtag feature I think in 2013 and people really don't use hashtags in there that much. Um, Tumblr and Pinterest, um, you can use hashtags. Pinterest hashtags just are a mark to search for content, so you can use them if you post a photo in there, but mainly hashtags increase your visibility in um, Instagram and, and Twitter. Um, some rules of hashtags, um, you don't put spaces in them. Spaces are a big no-no. Um, if your hashtag contains multiple words, you want to group them all together. If you want to differentiate between words, use capital letters instead of spaces. Um, uppercase letters will not alter your search results at all. Um, numbers are supported, but punctuation is not. And keep in mind that on Twitter, the at symbol um, is something completely different. Using at before a person's name or before a word will directly tag that person. So, um, And also, just like I said before, remembering that your hashtag visibility depends on your privacy settings. So if your Twitter account is private, only those authorized to see your tweets will have ac access to your hashtag. Um, if you're curious what other hashtags are trending through social media, you can check out hashtags.org, which will let you know what's popular at the time. Also, Twitter has a built-in trending section where you can also see what's trending. If you're trying to increase your visibility and followers, um, try to incorporate some of those hashtags into your tweets or posts. Um, that does help. So, um, and also on campus, we have our own hashtag, and it's Vandygram. So specifically Instagram, if you're taking pictures on campus, definitely use the Vandygram hashtag. Um, at social.vanderbilt.edu is a nice compilation of all of the posts that people are submitting. Um, there's a Vandygram section, so if you use that hashtag, your photo will appear in that section. So that's increased, uh, increased visibility for everybody. So definitely check that out if you're, if you're posting pictures on campus. Um, and in my opinion, the, the best way to post photos is the native post from each app. Um, posting from Facebook to Facebook is generally the best because you can see what your post looks like directly within the application. However, nobody really has time to do that. If you're posting to multiple networks, if you have Twitter and Facebook <coughs> and Google Plus and Instagram, it's a lot of work to go in and individually post a photo in every single account. Um, so there are a few different apps that Jenny and I are going to speak about that will help manage your time. So, um, yeah, there's one more. Before we get into the apps, though, I should just mention that there are ways to link your Facebook and your Twitter accounts together. I wouldn't recommend doing that because of the way they communicate. What ends up happening in Facebook, if you link your Facebook account to your Twitter account and you post from Facebook to Twitter, it ends up looking like that, where it says facebook.me slash a bunch of letters. Those links don't show up as photos in Twitter. So when you're looking at your Twitter account, if you post this way, it's not going to display as a picture. It's not going to display as a twit pic. And photos get three to four more times, three to four times more engagement than just a link. So in generally speaking, you don't want to link your Twitter and Facebook together. And also, you can see that it kind of gets, it gets cut off on the end there. Your post isn't in its entirety. So I see that, and I, it, it bothers me. So, and I've always heard never to do that. So try to avoid linking those two together. It is a time saver, but that's one, way, that's one thing that people probably should avoid. And then there's one more thing that ends up happening on Instagram that I'm okay. going to let Jenny talk about. So this is for those of you who have both Instagram and Twitter. Um, you can see that this student during commencement posted to Instagram, thanks Vanderbilt for playing my song one more time. And when Instagram, he had it set up to automatically post from Instagram to Twitter. And when he did that, 
Instagram decided that the Twitter representative of Vanderbilt University was not actually the Vanderbilt University Twitter, but Melanie Moran, who is um, very important here at Vanderbilt, but is not actually our official Twitter account. So this is something that can happen when you have all your social networks set up to talk to each other. They're smart, but they're not that smart. So things like this will happen. They'll tag the wrong person. It'll be very confusing. So as Anna was saying, you know, the best way to do it is to post to Facebook, from Facebook, post to Twitter, from Twitter. But again, not everybody has time for that. So the one service, or one of the services that we're recommending is an app called If This Then That. And what If This Then That does, it's a tool that kind of lets you create connections between different services in a way that's a little bit smarter than letting the apps post themselves. So as you can see what we have here on the screen, if you post a picture to Instagram, that's there in the middle, then if this, then that will automatically upload that picture to your Dropbox. So you have it sitting there waiting for you. And you can create unlimited recipes. That's what they call them. They call them recipes um, in if this, then that. So for example, um, our colleague Lacey here has something set up in her, every time she posts to Instagram with the hashtag G it generates an email or, or posts a picture of her baby to Instagram with the hashtag G. It automatically generates an email to her grandmother with a picture of her son in it. So that's the kind of thing you can set up in this service to kind of, you know, it's just a, it, you have to make them work for you. You can't just use what's natively in there. You have to think what's going to fit your lifestyle. Like I have a blog and if I tag certain things with a hashtag in Instagram and automatically post it to my Tumblr blog. So it's just kind of figuring out the stuff that is going to make your life a little easier and setting the recipes up. And it does take a little bit of kind of playing with and getting used to it. Like you can see a few more recipes here. Like if you take a picture on your iPhone, it will automatically upload it to a specific album on your Facebook account. Or you can set it up to if you post to Instagram, it will automatically send them to an album on Facebook called Instagram. So if you're only on a couple of accounts, this is a really good way to kind of link them together. Um, I guess that's, that's pretty much it for If This Then That. Again, you, it's a free app. You download it, and you just start messing with it. And that's kind of the takeaway with a lot of these is you just download it, and you can't break them, so just keep playing with them until you figure out how it works for you. And then Anna's got our, our second app that we're talking about. Yeah, the next one um, is Hootsuite. And that's also um, a desktop application. You can use that in your web browser as well. Um, but it's a really good, good tool to manage multiple, multiple social networks. Um, and you can post to all the networks that you have loaded into there at one, with one post. So you can choose to post a photo to Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Google+ and LinkedIn. Right now, they don't have an Instagram uh, capability. But I found that it, this tool is very useful. Most people who, who manage so any multiple social media channels use something like this. Um, Hootsuite is the most popular by far. Um, it also has a built-in analytic system so you can see how well your posts are doing, how your engagement is. And that being said, Hootsuite isn't the best to post to every single network. Um, I personally use it. I manage Peabody's, Peabody College's social media and I use it to post Twitter updates as well as Google Plus and for LinkedIn. But if you use it to post to Facebook, you might run into a little bit of a problem with, again, the images showing up as links. So generally speaking, I just find it's best to post to Facebook with Facebook. Um, Facebook's always kind of an outlier in yeah. all the feeds. <laughs> it's always weird. Um, and the other thing, too, is that with this, with the pro version of Hootsuite, which is the next level up, it's free. Hootsuite is a free application. But the pro level, which is one level up, I think it's like $8 a month, it allows you to uh, fix that problem in Twitter. When you post a photo and it doesn't appear as a TwitPic, it just appears as a link. In the pro version, you can go in in your settings and you can tell Hootsuite to post all um, pictures to Twitter as TwitPics, which is really, really nice. Um, and I find it's a great tool because you can just schedule a tweet, you can take that tweet and push it out to Google+, and then you can repurpose that other way. So it's a, it's a big time saver. Um, 
And there, there's an example in case anybody doesn't know what I'm referring to as far as a twit pic. That is how a properly posted Twitter picture will appear. If it's disappearing as a link, that photo would not be displayed and people scrolling through a Twitter feed wouldn't see it. It would just show up as a link. So, um, Photos get way more engagement, so the, the more you can have your photo appear as an actual photo rather than a link, the better. That's a general rule of thumb. And a lot of stuff with Hootsuite is more if you're doing this on a professional level, like you're managing a social media account for part of your job. Something like if this then that is going to be really good on a personal level, you know, if you're only dealing with Facebook or a Twitter account or an Instagram. Um, and then there are lots of other helpful apps out there that um, can take the photos that you have taken with your camera and do different things to them. Um, you've got stuff like Over, which puts text on your picture. You can kind of change the font. You can, you know, if it, I, I don't use it a whole lot, but um, if you're someone who likes putting text on pictures, it's really good. Um, Instasize allows you to post to Instagram, which has that square format. It puts bars on the top and bottom or the sides of each picture, so you get the full picture in a square format, so you're not losing some of the picture when it crops it for Instagram. Um, collage apps, Daniel demonstrated one of them. There are hundreds out there. Some are free, some are paid. They all do variations of the same thing. Same thing with um, repost apps. That's the last thing. That's mostly for Instagram because Instagram doesn't have a great um, internal way of reposting other people's pictures the way that Twitter does. Again, there are, like it says up there, there are a million versions of every single app. and you know, your phone's not going anywhere, so just keep downloading them, keep trying them out. If you don't like them, delete them. If it's a paid app, I encourage you to read the reviews that are on the App Store, but make sure you're reading them for the most recent version of the apps, because sometimes the apps work great, and then they do a big update, and all of a sudden the app doesn't work so well anymore. Um, and then there's websites like Mashable and Lifehacker, and we'll provide links to those in the roundup later, um, that do pretty consistent app roundups of what's new, what's fun, what's good, what's bad. So keeping those on your radar is, is a good idea. Um, so that's it um, from us. If you're taking, just a reminder, if you're taking pictures on campus, use the hashtag Vandygram, and that gets them seen and hopefully out there on official university social media channels. Um, Vanderbilt's official social page is social.vanderbilt.edu, so you can see what other people are out there posting and doing. Um, if you're not already signed up for Digital VU, you can sign up using the links down there at the bottom for more events like this. Um, we're going to be doing stuff about website analytics if you're managing sites for your department web design, and then kind of a little bit further in depth on social media. And we are going to have all this stuff up in a few days. Um, if you RSVP'd, you will get an email with a link to the blog post. If you did not RSVP, as Anna said earlier, just put your email on the list over there, and we will get it out to you. And then questions for any and all presenters today. I'm going to feel bad if nobody has a question. <laughs> all right. Um, okay. So in terms of if, like if, I, if I'm going to get a new phone, but I really want to get the phone to get a really good camera, I mean, do you recommend something besides the i6? So uh, yeah, that's a great question. The question was, are there phones that have better cameras? Is the hardware better? The answer is yes. There's oh, there's a lot that have tried to specialize in that. Um, Lumina 1120? Lumia? Lumia 11... I have no idea what I just said. <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, literally just Google kind of like this. Yeah. Well, I did and it's overwhelming. Yeah. Like, yeah. Again, it, it, it is overwhelming. The one thing you need to remember is that megapixels aren't the be-all, end-all. So there is a camera out there that's like, we've got 40 megapixels. Well, big deal. Um, it's the quality of the image. It's how it performs in low light. I'm with Lacey. I think you just Google it, and there's bound to be some reviews and kind of roundups, like, oh, top five phones for taking pictures. But then you might suffer other components of your phone 
besides the camera? So then it's, now you're on a platform that's not iOS, it's not Apple. Might they have as many apps for editing? It's a good point. You don't know. Um, Mashable, again, Mashable and Lifehacker don't just do the app roundups. They'll do phone rundowns, and they're pretty reliable as far as their, their takes on it. Right. So the new the new Apple camera. The question was, what's the resolution? Is it any better? Yes. Uh, in the new one, it's gone from six megapixels to eight, which sounds kind of incremental. But um, the bottom line is, you can run off an 11 by 14 straight off the camera, assuming you're not doing a lot of cropping, and it's going to hold together relatively well. Still low light is the, the bane of cameras, even, even at the pro level, right? Even in this room, you think there's a lot of light in here? There's not. It's actually quite dark in here. Yeah? So with the uh, Hootsuite app, does it allow you to track the analytics for the stuff that's not interested in the platform? Is it the um, it's the question was: Does Hootsuite um, track analytics from other platforms that aren't post directly through Hootsuite? Is that right? Um, it it does. It includes all of your networks because your networks are linked into it. However, it is a little bit quirky. If if you're posting on Twitter, for example, from Hootsuite and you are having Hootsuite shorten your links for you, the analytics can get a little a little bit screwed up. So there is analytics built in for every thing but you generally need to cross check that with with another application just to be sure that it's accurate um, just because of the link shortening capability but um, as far as Facebook and Google Plus goes it's pretty good there are there are either Android exact apps or equivalents and we'll be including those in the emailed link that comes out. I've kind of researched the equivalent apps. And for Windows Phone, there just aren't as many apps, but we tried to find the best Windows Phone photography apps. So if anybody in here has that, we did our best. The editing one that you showed is a, is a Google product, so that one's definitely in there. Yeah. Most of them, most of them are in Android phones. Like there, there's usually an exact Android version. Anybody else? It's kind of a weird question, but I have an Android baby, so I'm always wanting to take the iPhone photos I get. I'm with them in France, because the proportions are wrong, and when I try to mess with it, it just doesn't work. This is just a problem. It's an aspect ratio. Uh, I think the iPhone does what, 4 by 3 I think so. Yeah. So what's that turn out to be like a 6 by 8 I mean, yeah. who can make a 6 by 8 So that right? Um, but in general, like, uh, InPix is one I use a lot for printing out my own photos online. They have cropping apps within the border of process. I'll tell you the other place that's really good stuff for dirt cheap is Costco. I mean, I guess it's pathetic. The CVS app has a photo in the all I did is I just turned. I, I just turned around him. All right, so the light's coming in primarily from the door. That's the main light source. The one that was most bad was where I'm shooting directly into the sun. You can see he's completely so into the sun. <laughs> nope. But anyway, uh, uh, so it's completely backlit. And then I turned about 45 degrees. It got a little bit better as that light starts to wrap around him. And then the best one was where the light's coming in from the front, okay, or kind of the side. You always sort of want your light broad, big light sources, wash them from the right. You want to be about 90 degrees. Your camera, light source at about 90 degrees, that's going to give you the best light. Yes. I just wonder, lighting-wise, if there's any, if there's 
Concerts are by far the the hardest uh, situation to shoot in, right? Because you have an enormous amount of black surrounded by this spotlit little dot. Um, that's where the exposure compensation is going to help you, and that's probably the one instance where I might use that digital zoom, where I pinch to zoom in or whatever they squeeze to zoom in, because then it's going to now it's going to adjust the exposure and it's going to give you a better shot. But um, the the one tip Jenny and I were talking about this earlier is turn your flash off, uh, particularly if you're using a, a a point and shoot or an SLR. Bless his heart, I saw some guy trying to take a photo of his kid's pr uh, uh, Christmas program, and that little flash kept coming up, and the the kid's like 50 yards away. Turn that thing off. Your flash is only good from about me to Sandra, right? So just turn it off because the camera is trying to incorporate all that information into the shot and it's going to actually underexpose uh, your, your, your image. You, yeah, you got it. Noise, noise is what happens when you're in a low light situation in your shadows. You'll see it in particular. The phone is trying to do some trickery behind the scenes and turn up the gain, um, but it's it's kind of like when you crank your stereo. You know how it get, gets kind of raspy. That's the same thing, except it's with light. Um, so yeah, low light is definitely where you're going to see. You're already seeing it on the pro end of like SLRs. Um, you know, people claiming, oh, you know, we sh uh, oh. Uh, Sony just came out with their new A7, and the entire commercial for it was filmed using moonlight because they're trying to show off how well it does in low light situations. So that's definitely the area of growth and the biggest Achilles heel of these little phones is, yeah, you shoot, uh, in, in my house, if I try to shoot my kids, it's just a blur, blur. So that... Yeah, great question. Because the flash is even worse. Uh, in terms of image quality, I'm willing to sit there and take a bunch of photos, which by the way, burst mode is something we didn't touch on, but if you hold your finger on that shutter button on the stock camera app, it's going to take like, it's like four or five frames a second. It's going to group all those together. So I'm willing to do that and risk not getting the image. Uh, I'm tra willing to trade that for a photo that's just completely blown out and then surrounded by this black around them. It's just a personal choice. It's an artistic choice. That's just, uh, I just can't stand that look. Is that just on iPhone 6, the first mode? Uh, I think it's on the 5S too. I think, I think it's, it's on the 5S, 5S too. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite helpful for shooting kids. They sort of live life in burst mode. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.